Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm pretty good. How about you? I'm doing great. That's, it's cold that, today, but I'm still cold. doing great. I wish Kinda I would have worn snug. socks down here. I have my slippers on, but not my socks. And no, my ankles a, are cold. <laughs> ankles are cold. It's a little, my ankles it's are cold. A little flurrying outside today. So I know. there's that. What better way to uh, be told a story? And I hear and you actually, have one. Actually, it's they're cold cases. Ooh, there you go. There you cold go. cases on a cold day. Let's see. And one is a listener request. Our good friend Chris Johnson, good friend uh, and listener Chris, Chris Johnson. Johnson, suggested this. One of the cases. We have two cold cases, and Chris requested the first. So, are you ready? I'm so ready. On November 17th, 2011, viewers across America tuned in to watch the new episode of The People's Court. For those unfamiliar with the show, it was an arbitration-based reality court TV show featuring Judge Marilyn Millian, who handled small claim disputes in a simulated courtroom setting. The show focused on ordinary people who have filed grievances with the court, but when they appear on the show, they agreed to drop their grievances with the court, basically, and just have the matter settled by Judge Milan. This is where I'd say, and have the court settled by Judge Wapner of uh, the People's Court. People, but it's not. That just ages you, right, my I'm little rain man? Saying, mm-hmm. I'm just saying. I know. So on a pre-recorded episode that aired that day, November 17th, a feuding couple, Dale Wayne Smith II, or Junior, and his ex fiance Michelle Parker, wanted to resolve a dispute about a $5,000 engagement ring that Smith claimed Michelle had drunkenly thrown over a hotel balcony during an argument. Michelle didn't deny that she had thrown the ring at Smith during this heated confrontation. And during the episode, Michelle claimed, quote, he gets pretty malicious and vindictive, and he's a mean person, especially when he's been drinking. Or especially when you take a ring and toss it uh, out into the no man's land. That's the what couple. Lisa Marie Presley did with Nick Cage, if you remember that. I don't. You oh, she threw out. it into water, though, didn't she? Yeah, in the ocean. Yeah. 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 The couple, who shared a set of twins, were in a relationship between 2006 and 2009. And during those years, Michelle also claimed that Dale had cheated on her numerous times. It had been Dale Smith's idea to add their grievances on public television, and Michelle had agreed to do it. In the end, the judge decided that the couple should split the cost of the ring, which makes sense. And Judge Milan chastised Parker for not letting Smith see his twins for a few weeks. She then called them both juvenile and, quote, complete idiots during the episode. Later, Michelle's mother, Yvonne Stewart, would tell ABC News that when Michelle returned from taping the episode, she said that the entire ordeal had been, quote, the most humiliating experience of my life. I don't ever want to see it, and I'd wish I'd never gone. Mm-hmm. I can understand that. On... November 17th, like I said earlier, that episode aired at around two o'clock in the afternoon, depending on where you are. And within hours of millions of viewers watching that episode, 33-year-old Michelle Parker vanished into thin air. Michelle Lori Parker was born on January 20th, 1978. She was a graduate of Winter Park High School in Orlando, Florida. And Orlando is the central part of the state, and it's home to over a dozen amusement parks, including Disney World and Universal Studios, where my family seems to love to vacation every year, along with billions of other people, I believe. Michelle worked three different jobs in and around the Orlando area. She cut hair at her mother's salon. She waited tables at a bar in Sanford called The Barn. And she owned a mobile tanning salon business called Glow Mobile Airbrush Tanning. That's where she would people would call her. She'd go to their house and give them a spray tan. That's a good idea, actually. Mm -hmm. 
On the morning of November 17th, 2011, Michelle met with her new boyfriend, Nathan Mitchell, for coffee. The People's Court episode dropped at about 2, and around 2.30 in the afternoon, she visited some of her family at the salon in Oviedo, Florida. Michelle told her mother and sister that she was going to go drop the twins off at their dad's house and then take a long nap because she had a shift at the bar that evening and she was really tired. At around 3.15 that afternoon, she and Nathan exchanged a few flirty texts with each other. You know, brand new relationship. Everybody, you love that part. So then three minutes later at 3.18, a security camera captured footage of Michelle dropping off the twins at Dale's apartment. Now, because of the angle of the camera, her departure from the building was not recorded. So as far as I know, there's no, you can't see her leave. At 3.30, Michelle's 11-year-old son from a former relationship called his grandma Yvonne to ask if his mother was at the salon because he'd come home from school to an empty house, which was very unusual. His grandmother informed him that she hadn't seen Michelle for about an hour. At 4.26 p.m., when Michelle still hadn't returned home to her son, nor had she called him or anybody in her family, Michelle's brother Dustin texted her to ask where she was, and the only response to this message was one word. Waterford, which is a town in Florida. Now, and this is interesting because I watched a short documentary that was done by one of the TV stations that I'll say at the end of the episode. But Michelle's mother said, you know, I called Dale and at first he didn't get on the phone. And then, uh, you know, she kind of made up a lie to get him on the phone. And then she asked him if she knew where Michelle was. And he goes, oh, I think she was going to go somewhere like shopping. And I think Waterford, she's going to go to Waterford. And this was before she even knew about this text. Mm -hmm. Now, the family found this pretty, this text unusual for several reasons. One was because Michelle would not have gone to Waterford when she was supposed to be home for her son. She was always a very responsible mother. Secondly, the text didn't sound like anything Michelle would normally text. And according to our family and friends, Michelle never texted one word responses. I always said she wrote a paragraph and her words were always accompanied by emojis and X's and O's. And one would think that if Michelle were indeed in Waterford and received a text from her brother inquiring where she was and knowing that she was supposed to be home for her son, her text would have been full of apologies, explanations or excuses as why she wasn't home where she was supposed to be. The one word response is almost more of a red flag than no response at all. At 6.53 in the evening, Michelle's sister, Lauren, tried calling her, and she didn't get any response. Her sister gave her a half hour to respond, and when she didn't, at 7.20, when there was no, Michelle hadn't returned home or she hadn't returned her sister's phone call, her sister reported Michelle missing to the Orlando Police Department. At 8 p.m., Michelle failed to show up for her shift at the barn in Sanford, and at about the same time, her cell phone quit working. Like they would call and there would be no. Later, we'd find out that police would find that it stopped pinging a tower near Belle Isle. Michelle's family was worried sick, obviously, and they spent a very sleepless and fretful night. They were scared for Michelle's well-being, as one would be. At first, they were concerned that maybe she had gotten into an accident because Michelle was not the type of person to be kind of like that no call, no show at work. Nor was she the type of person that would just go out and stay out all night without telling anybody her plans. And at the time, it didn't occur to them that any foul play would be involved. I mean, I don't think you normally would, right? I mean, your mind doesn't normally jump to a conclusion that, you know. No, I think you get angry because you're like, oh, why, you know, where are where they? Where the hell and is then, she? Yeah. Then you start And then worrying. concerned something happened. But I don't, foul play is not the first thing that goes into your head. However, the next day on November 18th, when Michelle's 2007 black Hummer H3 was found abandoned in an apartment complex just eight miles from Waterford, her family's immediate concern was that she'd been a victim of a random carjacking. Carjacking is a crime of opportunity, so the perpetrators can't always be picky. But still, if you just take a quick look at the most common vehicles targeted by carjackers, it shows that vehicles like Honda Accord, Toyota Camrys, and several different pickup trucks are the usual targets. It's always some kind of Japanese car or American pickup trucks. Not only was Michelle's vehicle a Hummer, but it also had a giant logo on the back window advertising her Glow Mobile Airbrush Tanning Company. You know, like those great big stickers, the see-through stickers. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. 
that would draw attention to anybody on the road. Rather forebodingly, when they found the Hummer in the parking lot, the logo had been removed from the car window. Really? And that takes time. Yeah. I don't. I mean, normally you would think you have to scrape it off, and it, I don't think it's a cling pull. I think you have to. I don't know. The ones but, I've seen, you'd have to scrape off and not pull it. Well, but it would definitely take time. So somebody would. was secure in what they were doing. So it just means that the person who drove the car to the apartment complex had most likely removed it so that a witness would be less likely to recognize the car. And now that the Hummer had been found, for some, it became more apparent that the vehicle had not been the target. But, you know, Michelle was the target. Since she was last seen at Dale's apartment, the police immediately moved to search the premises. So if the police found any evidence of foul play during that search, they've never revealed what it was. Now, Michelle's family at this point are just terrified. And they spent the Thanksgiving holiday along with friends searching for Michelle. Most people now agreed that Michelle's disappearance resulted from foul play. Not only had nobody heard from her in six days, but Michelle would not have missed Thanksgiving with her children. In addition, she was in a brand new relationship. I mean, that's the good part, right? It didn't seem likely that she was missing on her own terms. Initially, Michelle's mother, Yvonne, and her family supported Michelle's ex, Dale Smith. On November 26, 2011, the police did a search of Dale's parents' house. And once again, anything found during that search has also not been revealed to the public. It soon came into light that Michelle had tried to get a restraining order against Dale. She alleged that Dale screamed at her and broke her windshield while holding one of the kids, the twins. And a look into Dale's past also brought to light some concerning facts. Dale had been married twice before. He was brought up on domestic battery charges by a second wife and pleaded guilty. His second wife also died of a drug overdose. He had a criminal record for drug possession and pleaded no contest to a school trespassing infraction. And Dale was also dishonorably discharged from the Marines. Uh -huh. The police named Dale Wayne Smith II, the one and only suspect in Michelle's disappearance, which is not surprising. And when he was asked to take a polygraph, he refused. Hmm. On November 29th, Yvonne Stewart, Michelle's mother, was given temporary custody of Michelle's and Dale's twins. This resulted from an independent investigation by the Florida Department of Children and Family Services, and not at the behest of Yvonne Stewart. The children had been living with Michelle and Yvonne, so, I mean, the grandmother was pretty much raising them anyway, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or with Michelle, I should say. So their grandmother had been a part of their daily lives since they could remember. However, the judge decided that the children were not in danger, and despite of Smith's pass, and he returned them to their father the next day. So Dale oh. got custody. At first, Yvonne was optimistic that she would get to continue to have contact with the twins. But by 2014, Dale took the children and moved to Tennessee and cut off all contact with Michelle's family. In the meantime, police and rescue continued to search for Michelle, but it was like searching for a needle in a haystack. Of course, because it's Florida, right? Uh -huh. There's multiple lakes, rivers, swamps, and lots of animals, not Ugh. to mention the humid conditions. Uh -uh. It was beginning to look as though any chance of finding Michelle was remote. It was determined that Michelle's cell phone last pinged around 8 p.m. the day she disappeared, like we said earlier. On December 9th, a police dive team found Michelle's iPhone 4 under a bridge in Lake Conway in Bell Island. Coincidentally, the lake was located between Dale's apartment building and his parents' home, and he would have had to drive across the bridge to get to his parents' house because that's where he said he was taking the kids or mm -hmm. where he took the kids that day, mm -hmm. right? Dale's lawyer stated that Dale had gone to his parents' residence at about 4.30 in the afternoon on the day Michelle went missing, which put him unquestionably on that bridge that day. The phone was found in remarkably good condition and underwent forensic analysis. Sadly, aside from footage of Michelle's Hummer stopped at a red light that the police released in November of 2013, there would be no more breaks or leads in this case. 
However, with the release of the red light footage, Detective Michael Moreski made a rather shocking accusation. He claimed that the disappearance of Michelle Parker was a two-man job and that he didn't believe that Smith acted alone. Moreski didn't clarify if he meant that the second party involved had helped with the disposal of the body or the murder of Michelle or both, but he believes strongly that there were two people involved somewhere. Mm -hmm. In March of 2012, Dale Smith, unemployed and in desperate need of money, filed a motion to refund the child support he had been paying into Michelle's account. The court agreed and refunded him the money. Earlier in the year, in January, Dale Smith's father, Dale Smith Sr., was arrested on charges of the sale of or manufacture of a controlled substance, possession of cannabis, and drug paraphernalia. With the case at a standstill, Michelle's mother, Yvonne, filed a wrongful death suit against Dale Smith II. She claims that she took this step in an effort to get information since during a wrongful death suit, the evidence against the defendant would be revealed and they would be formally questioned. And she filed two suits. One was immediately thrown out and the lawyer's like, it was going to be tough to win every day. You know, it was, Mm -hmm. it would be tough to win, but the judge says that she should probably file again. So she did. And in 2016, a ninth judicial circuit judge ordered Dale Smith to answer questions in the deposition. He pled the fifth on over 100 of the 491 questions asked. And right now, this, the result of this wrongful death suit, if there is one, it's not available. We couldn't find it, any closure on this anywhere in the end. I actually did try to call the ninth, the court, and was put on hold for what seemed like forever. I will say that in 2018, Dale and his lawyer tried to get the case thrown out, but due to circumstances, the judge let it stay and gave the case like one more year, which would have put to the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, which is when COVID hit and shut everything Mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. We don't know where this case stands as of this point. It's kind of just in limbo. As far as I know, it's still going. It hasn't been thrown out of court yet. That's the best that we can get. That's for the wrongful death. And it's kind of hard because there's not really a body, but it's suspect that he didn't answer a lot of questions but yeah and like but she's then you kids. have to where's she gonna go right and also i mean if you're up for a wrongful death suit you're not going to answer any questions and incriminate yourself right so i guess pleading the fifth is his it's just i don't know i know what anyway you're yeah dale smith continued to deny yvonne stewart and her family visitation rights to michelle's children having children denied the right to see parents or grandparents except in abusive situations, can be detrimental to that child's psychological health. Because one, I mean, one day they're part of an extended family unit with grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins, and then the next they're totally ripped away from them, right? They're just, these people are gone from their lives, especially when they're tiny, teeny tiny. Mm -hmm. And equally the heartache and hurt a grandparent feels for children that they've helped care for and love is equally devastating. And that's why Yvonne worked to pass a law granting visitation rights to grandparents. Governor Rick Scott signed the Grandparents' Bill of Rights into law in 2015. Florida courts hold firmly that, quote, statutes attempting to compel visitation or custody by a grandparent based solely on the best interest of the child are unconstitutional. The rulings acknowledge that the fundamental right to parent without intrusion by the government has long been recognized by the United States and Florida constitutions. In other words, a parent is not legally obligated to retain a relationship with their parents or their in-laws. However, generally speaking, this course of action is rarely recommended outside of special circumstances. And that's why the law that Rick Scott signed is very narrow and is very specific about what conditions are that grandparents can petition the court for visitations. Some of these conditions include when a parent has been killed, is in a vegetative state, or is missing. And it also includes when a parent has been convicted of a felony or an offense of violence that substantially threatens the child's well-being. And unfortunately, after having worked to create this law and get it passed, Yvonne Stewart petitioned the courts for visitation for Michelle's children and was denied. 
So as it stands right now, she can't see them until they turn 18, which is in 2024. And she's missed out on her grandchildren's entire lives through no fault of her own, which is heartbreaking. Losing her child and grandchildren is... In addition, the twins' older brother has been denied any contact with his siblings. In 2019, Detective Michael Moreski retired, and in his career, he solved 54 of his 60 homicide cases. That's a really damn good track record. He says he doesn't dwell on the 54, but he is haunted by the six he didn't solve. Um, He didn't leave the criminal justice completely, though. He has joined the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's genetic genealogy team, which uses genetic DNA to help solve cases. And as a result of Moreski's retirement, a new detective, Michael Fields, has taken over Michelle's case. Detective Field says that they're backing up and they're looking at the case all over again. And he's looking at it as, quote, everybody's a suspect until they know otherwise. So they're mm-hmm. starting fresh. Good. Detective Fields also acknowledges that it's critical that this case needs somebody to come forward with information. In September of 2022, the police began searching an area in Titusville near Port St. John, where Dale Smith used to work. And it's the first major search for Michelle in years. It came from a tip encouraged by a new anonymously donated $200,000 reward, but nothing has been found during that search. Michelle Lori Parker had dark hair when she disappeared, and she's about 5'6 and weighs about 125 and 135 pounds, and she has brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a white t-shirt and a blue Florida Gators hooded zip-up jacket, blue jeans, flip-flops, a silver-colored watch, and a large cross necklace set with artificial diamonds. Michelle has angel wings tattooed on her back, a butterfly in her lower right side of her abdomen, and spiraling flowers extended from her hip to her underarm on her right side. She'd be 44 years old at the time of this podcast episode. So if you have any information regarding the disappearance of Michelle Parker, please call the tip line at 386 402 3729 or the Orlando Police Department at 407-246-2979. That's Michelle. It's her disappearance. She needs to be found. Her family, her poor mother is just, she's worked so hard. Not that other families don't do this, but still, I mean, it's devastating. So we're going to stay in the same area for this next missing person, um, but we're going to go back to 2009 to 27-year-old Tracy Eileen Ocasio. She was born on August 10th, 1981. Tracy was a very vibrant, outgoing woman who loved reptiles and cats. Me too, Tracy. Me too. (laughs) During her teenage years, Tracy's family moved to Florida from Virginia, and she had a bit trouble adjusting initially, but she soon settled into the Florida way of life. And she also became a huge NBA Magic fan. Oh, go Magic! On the evening of May 26, 2009, Tracy had gone to a local pub called The Tap Room in Ocoee, Florida, to watch the NBA Eastern Conference Finals. The Orlando Magic were playing the Cleveland Cavaliers. Tracy and her dad, Joe, often went to the games in person, but her father was going out of town, so Tracy went to the tap room, which was always her backup plan. That's where she liked to watch the game with all the other Magic fans. And when LeBron James went up for his last-minute three-pointer, the whole bar gasped and held their breath. The shot hit off the rim, and the Orlando Magic won 116-114. to that had to have been an exciting game. You can just imagine what the bar would have sounded like. Fun. That's what yeah. it sounds like. So normally, Tracy would have texted uh, her f- family and friends, go magic, you know, but that text never came. Mm. The next morning when Liz Ocasio, or Liz Ocasio woke up and Tracy wasn't home, she texted her daughter to see where she was. Tracy was still living at home, but she 
you know, at 27, Tracy was still living at home, but she would still occasionally stay out with friends, right? I mean, she's an adult, doesn't, there's no rules there, but her parents always heard from her the next day. When Tracy didn't answer the first text, her mother assumed it was because it was just super early in the morning. So she waited and texted her again at 8.30 a.m. Still didn't get a response. Liz then started calling around to Tracy's friends, but none of them had heard. Liz then started calling around to Tracy's friends, but none of them had seen or heard from her. So like every mother does, you know, when they're panicked, she called hospitals. She even called the morgue and no Tracy. And by this point, it was getting to be late in the afternoon when Liz reported her daughter missing. And that's when Joe immediately came home from his trip. The next morning on the 27th, the police called the Ocasio home reporting that Tracy's car, a bright yellow Chevy Colbolt, had been left parked on somebody's property on Franklin Street and they wanted it removed. Hmm. Liz drove to where the car was parked and found that the front seats were pushed all the way up as if someone had been trying to remove something from the back seat. The seats were so far up that nobody could have driven it like that. Like, it was pushed up against the steering wheel, Mm -hmm. right? Tracy's keys, wallets, and cell phone have never been found, FYI. The car was, but nothing else. Really? The police began their inquiries and discovered from a friend of Tracy's that Tracy had agreed to give a man by the name of Jimmy Hathaway a ride home from the bar. Hmm. Jimmy was a local guy that Tracy knew casually from watching the game at the tap room. They were both regulars at the bar. And their police actually found a video of Hathaway and Tracy leaving the bar together that night. So police, doing their good police work, immediately brought James Hathaway in for questioning. When they questioned him on May 29th, Hathaway said that Tracy had given him a ride home and then left. And surprise, Hathaway failed a polygraph and then asked for an attorney. However, he did voluntarily give his DNA. The police got a search warrant for the house that Hathaway lived in with his parents. And surprise, it was located exactly 150 yards where Tracy's car had been found abandoned. The police found searches on Hathaway's computer for cannibalism, murder, and how to commit suicide. They also found drug paraphernalia and, uh, yeah, they arrested him. And James Hathaway had several run-ins with the law in the past, including an arrest for juvenile kidnapping causing bodily harm and drug possession. So while that's going on, in the meantime, the the Ocasio's organized search efforts. They called in Tim Miller's EcuSearch, which is a horse-mounted search and recovery team that searched for Tracy from June 12th to June 20th. Volunteers searched 2,500 acres of Florida's swamplands. Now, Florida has over 30,000 bodies of water within its borders. And the woods and wetlands are infested with alligators, snakes, spiders, and other dangerous animals. And don't forget that how hot and humid Florida is. So these volunteers, when I looked to see what you need to do to be a volunteer, you only had to be 18 years old. And for this search, for Tracy's search, they said to make sure you bring your own provisions. And you had to wear like the high boots and sunscreen and bring your own water and food and stuff. But honestly, I cannot imagine how brutal those conditions to search. I mean, I don't think you and I can do it. No, I, <laughs> We're not. I would, as much be, as we'd want to, I don't think no. we could. I mean, you'd probably have to be in fairly good physical shape well, to do like the wetlands. That stuff you're going to find out. I, I mean, it's scary enough to be looking for a missing person, right? But then to have to contend with snakes, gators, snakes. Gators, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Kudos to any volunteer who searches ever. for anyone ever. Kudos to any volunteer, period. <laughs> be exactly. <it> a fireman, <laughs> anything. <laughs> exactly. Post, postal worker, doesn't matter. So cadaver dogs were also brought in with these searches. They didn't hit on any of James Hathaway's, or of the Hathaway property, I should say. But when they were in that area with Tracy's car, they only hit Tracy's car. They didn't go anywhere else. So Tracy was, you know, take Uh that with what you will. Uh Almost a month after Tracy went missing, a Disney worker called in a tip to the police. The witness, who had been on their way to work for an early shift on the morning of May 27th, 2011, that was the morning after Tracy was last seen, On their way to work, they saw a yellow Chevy Cobalt parked northbound on the southbound road with its headlights on. 
So, in other words, the car was parked on the side of the road facing the oncoming traffic, which Mm -hmm. is why the witness noticed it in the first place. The area the car was parked was adjacent to Lake Apopka, which the police searched and found nothing. On August 27th, 2009, a boot was discovered close to Lake Bennett. Now, this boot was exactly like the one Tracy wore all the time, but this one appeared too new and it wasn't, didn't seem like it was worn enough to be Tracy's. But investigators ran DNA tests on the inside of the boot and the test came back inconclusive. In June of the following year, cadaver dogs were keenly interested in the Lake Bennett area. And again, a thorough search was done and nothing was found. So frustrating. Mm. During all this, the Ocasios would discover that there was another parent in the area whose child was missing and was last seen with James Hathaway. 27-year-old Christopher George, known as Chris, also disappeared in 2009. James Hathaway and another man were seen coming out of the woods on the evening of February 12, 2009, just as a police officer was driving by. The officer stopped and questioned Hathaway and his friend, and they said that a third man, Chris George, had taken some sort of mind-altering drug and ran into the woods. They claimed that they had gone in to find him, but couldn't. So Mm -hmm. they had left. That's when the police found him. Christopher George had a history of going on drug binges, so not much was thought about at the time. The police did search for him, but couldn't find him. Two years later, Christopher George, his bones were found in Lake Carter, 15 miles from Orlando. Unfortunately, because of the condition of the remains, no cause of death could be determined. So, they're stuck. But however, one woman's decision to call the police with the story of her encounter with Hathaway would change things forever. Rachel Clark had been watching television when Hathaway was arrested during a search of his home in connection with the disappearance of Tracy. She immediately recognized him as a man who had tried to kill her in August of 2008. Oh, Rachel's story was eerily similar to that of Tracy Ocasio's. Rachel had given James Hathaway a ride home from a bar. And again, she was familiar with him from hanging out at some of the same places, but they were not necessarily friends. They were just kind of acquaintances. Mm -hmm. However, as the two said goodnight and hugged each other, James began to choke Rachel. She was able to escape from the vehicle, but Hathaway chased her and tackled her to the pavement where he began to strangle her, banging her head against the curb, saying, quote, don't make me kill you. Oh. Terrifying. The only thing that saved Rachel's life was a neighbor who came outside and saw Hathaway strangling her. When the neighbor called out, quote, are you okay? Both Rachel and Hathaway looked surprised to see her, and each for different reasons, obviously. Rachel was relieved, and Hathaway was scared and ran away. When Rachel reported the attack to the police, They didn't seem to take it entirely seriously as they were unable to locate James Hathaway. They were unable to locate a man who not only lived his entire life right there in the area in Okawi, but was also employed there and was known by many of the bar going crowd. Seems like they didn't try very hard. I, I, yeah, I agree. Two former girlfriends of James Hathaway also said that he had attacked them. And then a friend of Hathaway told the court that when he and Hathaway went out, Hathaway was really aggressive towards women. You don't say. His friend even said that Hathaway enjoyed choking women. And supposedly Hathaway told him that he could make people disappear and to not ever make him mad because he could do it because he had done it before. Pretty damn scary. Well, seems like uh, that person has a little problem and uh, Mm -hmm. he needs to be taken care of off the street. Yeah. In May of 2011, James Hathaway was given life in prison for attempted murder of Rachel Clark, shocking almost everybody in the courtroom. The Ocasios celebrated this sentencing because it meant that the person who was most likely responsible for their daughter's disappearance would never see the light of day ever again. And to date, Hathaway has lost all his appeals, so he will be safely nestled in prison. A lot of people, or some people I should say, believe that there might be a connection between James Hathaway and the well-known disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. Remember Jennifer, who went missing from her Orlando condominium in January mm. of 2006. Kessie had worked in Ocoee, where Hathaway lived. 
And before moving into her condo, Kessie had lived very close to the tap room where Tracy was last seen. Jennifer's dad, Drew, said that for the three years that Jennifer lived next to the tap room, it was a regular hangout spot for her. So if there is evidence connecting James Hathaway to the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie, the police have never released, uh, released it at all. And so for now, it just remains only a possible theory. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think they'd release that. They're going to keep that. No, that they're going to keep that close yeah. to their chest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Tracy Eileen Ocasio has never been found. Her parents have given up hope to finding her alive, but they would like to bring her home for a proper burial. Mm. Tracy was 5'6 with brown hair and eyes, and she was last seen wearing a black tank top, jeans, a green and white hat, and a jacket. And if you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Tracy or her disappearance, please call the Ocoee Police Department at 407-905-3160. And honestly, if you have any information on any of these three women, Michelle Parker, Tracy Ocasio, or Jennifer Kessie, you can make a tip at the crime line by calling 1-800-423-8477. I mean, these parents deserve closure. Awful. So, I can't even imagine, and I don't ever want to have to no. imagine. It's awful. No. And if you, you've got the time, there's three short documentaries, each on these women, Michelle, Tracy, and Jennifer. And it's done by WFTV Channel 9 with investigative reporter Shannon Butler. And she goes and she interviews these women's families and the mm-hmm. detectives on the case. You know, they're about, two of them are 20 minutes long. I think Jennifer case, Jennifer's case is over like 40 minutes long. But like she, investigative reporter does a really good job. At, the detectives are really interesting. Like on Michelle's case, he can't really go into it, but they mm-hmm. use this new kind of technology that's never been used in the state of Florida, but they can't say what it is because there's a gag order because they of the search warrant. I mean, it's just, it's really interesting. I highly suggest, you can find them on YouTube and I will put them in the show notes. Well, you know, I'm so, going to be watching it. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's good. It's what they're, I do. They're, and they're new. They're, I think they were done in September of last year. So they're all up to date and everything. And watching Tracy's parents, I mean, mm, all the parents mm-hmm. are sad, but Tracy's parents, they have totally given up hope, like completely giving up hope of even fi- getting her body back because, of course, Florida swamps well, and I, water. I mean, I, it's what a place. I'm trying to think of the words here, but uh, right. where that's located, I, I would highly doubt much has ever recovered there. Ex- after the, how that. many years? Yeah. Yeah. But they said that the finding of Brittany Drexel's body kind of gave them hope. Mm-hmm. And because they quit completely doing, they quit doing interviews, they quit doing anything. Mm-hmm. They just kind of have given up hope. But then the finding of Brittany Drexel kind of changed mm-hmm. it and they're ready to do it again. So hopefully somebody, we know somebody out there knows what happened. Hadaway's not talking at all. I don't know. It's just very... It's um, mm-hmm. shocking what humankind can do t- to each other. That's for sure. Exactly, it is. Well, that's it's very shocking. That's a um, sad, and I hate to mm-hmm. hear that. It's just and there's so many missing. So many. So if you know anything about anything about anybody missing, <laughs> please call. So if you know anything about anything about anything ever in the whole wide world, <sighs> please help people's families. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Thanks, Chris Johnson, for his uh, request for Michelle Parker. Thanks, Chris. And we had any Mm -hmm. promos, Jen? We do. Our buddy Edward October is coming back. For those of you that know, he's the one that does our listener discretion. And he's got a new season coming out in February, which is just a week away, isn't it? Oh, is it? Yep, it is. Something like that. So, uh, time goes by so quickly, but anyway, uh, yeah. So listen to his promo. He always does a fine job. Also, we put out last the week before. Mm, I think it was last Friday, the 13th, Friday, the 13th. Friday 13th. We put out the rogue transmissions that he, Edward wrote and go give that a listen. I think we're only going to keep that up for 30 days. So you better pretty, listen to it now. Or pretty if you don't talented find it fella. here. Yep. You can find Edward um, October in October Pod VHS or October Pod AM 
Um, the October Pod AM is on all your podcast apps, and October Pod VHS is on YouTube. He always does a f- fantastic job, and he's he such an awesome person. I mean, he's he we've never met him, of course, but <laughs> no, no, he's he does the spooky stuff, but he's like a warm, fuzzy guy. <laughs> he's like now one you, of the nicest people we know. You spoiled Honest. it for all those people because they're going to be I like, know. "What? I, I thought know. he was a terrible No, not person. really. He is. He's so creepy. Yeah, he's exactly. So right. creepy. Good, you're ruining my rap, man. I know. Creepy in a good way. Creepy Any in a good way. way. Is that but such anyway, a that, thing? Maybe I don't know. Creepy. He's creepy, but in a good way. Well, Vincent Price was creepy in a good way. Yeah. Yeah, I right? got you. I'm just laughing. Right? Even when he was with Kermit, he was still kind of creepy. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Love Vincent. Anyway, but that's it. That's all I've got. All right. Well, uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, another yep. another horrible tale yes. that hopefully gets justice or sees justice. But until then, remember, lock your doors. Keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya. The human experiment has ended. The earth has been obliterated. A plague of cholera burns through the outer colonies, and the last of the great houses drifts at the edge of the Kuiper Belt, carrying a macabre secret. The only thing standing between Twilight House and the death of all living things is Fort Providence Transit Station on the dark side of Pluto's largest moon. The Ghosts of Pluto. October Pod presents an audio drama written by M.J. McAdams, produced, edited, and directed by Edward October. Coming this February.